Well, I'm Laura, and um, I, um, I live locally near here, um, in this drought, so I, I absolutely love it here, uh, because how many of you are, are locally-ish? Yes, <laughs> lovely, lovely foraging ground here, loads of hedgerows <coughs> and go out and gather all sorts of um, wild plants and herbs, and that's what I love about the area, because that's one of my favourite things to do. Um, and it's through the foraging that I came to learn about natural skin care and then about the plant seed oils that you use in them. Um, because I'd done all the making preserves and wines and all those things that you make with Pedro produce. And I wanted more ways to bring all these lovely plants into my daily life and discovered actually um, you can use them in the skincare and have them on an absolute daily basis. So that's where I started putting herbs in skincare and through that I um, got to know all the different plant seed oils that you use in skincare. Um, and it, I had an ambition to go top to toe, natural, all blend it myself. And I, I've got there, but it took me about 10 years to do so. <laughs> so bit by bit, learning all the different things you need to know. So I, I, my ambition is to try and make it simpler for anyone else who might want to go on that kind of journey. So that's where I come back, writing the book that's all, all about it, and also creating um, these kits. So I'll show you the kits here. Um, they've got all the ingredients you need to be able to make your own um, skincare really simply and easily. So they're my, my attempts at making it easier. But today's all about the actual plant seed oils and how magical they are. Um, so I use the term magical for them, which uh, I think is justified, I believe, um, because they are such incredible ingredients. Um, you know, a seed is, is the source of life. It's, it's got all that vitality held within it. And plant seed oils are basically those seeds pressed in the oil that comes out of those seeds. So all that vitality, all that force and life is in um, the plant seed oils that you get. Um, and you're probably aware of the natural skincare market is growing massively at the moment. And those products are using these plant seed oils. And um, they're fantastic products that you can get now. Um, because the difference in those plant seed oils compared to the kind of traditional mineral-based petroleum oils, which yeah, I was traditionally using products I was buying sort of 20 years ago, um, the difference is incredible. Um, and I think that difference has been that the mineral oils are coming from um, a, a essentially dead source, they're coming from rocks. Um, and so, yes, they will provide that kind of barrier function and moisturising function by holding in water on your skin, but they don't provide anything else really for us, and they'll sit on the skin, they have the potential to clog pores. They're really not providing much more benefit beyond what they're doing there on the surface of the skin. Whereas the plant seed oils that have come from a living natural source from those seeds, they've still got all that vitality within them. And so when they go onto your skin, they're actually working with your skin's natural processes. They're very similar in composition to the oils that we produce ourselves anyway. And um, they also come packed with additional nutrients, such as fatty acids, vitamins and things, which are all in there. And because they work with our skin, we can metabolise that and we can use it. And they're, they're made primarily, they're, they're made of essential fatty acids. Um, and they're essential because our body absolutely needs them. Um, but our body can't make them ourselves, so we need to get those acids through our diet or through our skincare. So that's why there's such a, a magical difference, I think, between your petroleum based skincare and your natural seed oil based skincare. And why I think they justify the term of being magical. Um, now, just so we're absolutely clear what we're talking about when we talk about seed oils, because there's lots of different names for them. And actually, plant seed oils is one of the least used names, which I think is shown because I find it the most accurate name for them. Um, so, you might have heard the term carrier oil, um, because the, the plant seed oils, um, they're, they're considered to carry the formula, so they're with the, the ingredient that other ingredients go into, so the basic formula. Um, and that's often a term used in aromatherapy because you can't put essential oils directly into your skin. So you need the carrier oil to put the essential oils into so that you can use them and get the benefits from them. Um, so in an, an aromatherapy situation, you're looking for an oil that's actually not going to be too disruptive to the, the essential oils that you're using. You want something quite sort of bland, middle of the road. Um, and sweet almond oil is a, a, an oil that's often used in that kind of context. A beautiful oil, absolutely nothing with it at all, but very middle of the road in comparison to what you can get across the full spectrum of plant seed oils that we can look at some of those others today. 
Um, you might have heard the term base oil as well. Um, and a base oil, again, the same oils you're referring to there. Um, and, and that's because they form the base of a formula. But um, for me, I find that slightly derogatory term because I think they're the star of the formula. So I don't like to use the term base oil. Um, you might hear the term fixed oil as well. And the fixed oil is describing <coughs> these oils in comparison to the volatile oils, which are essential oils. So it's just a way of comparing those two oils. That's another term. Or the other term that's very often used, but more often in a culinary context, is to call them vegetable oils. Um, so think of grapeseed oil, sunflower oil, all things we're used to using in our kitchens. They're all part of this family of, of plant seed oils, um, but they are referred to as vegetable oils. And it, all those terms have a place, but I, I think plant seed oil actually honours where these oils have come from and indicates the, kind of the power that they really hold because they've come there from seeds. That's the term I like to use. Um, and in terms of how they're, they're made, um, the, the seed is, is cold pressed, and that's a very traditional way of making plant seed oils. These oils have been used for millennia by people right across the globe. And of course, typically, people will always use the oil that's, that's very local to them. Um, so they, they get used to, to what's in their own climate. Um, now, of course, we have the choice of oils from right across the globe, so there are hundreds of different oils for us to choose from. So I say they might be cold pressed, um, which is the traditional way. Um, there might be heat added into that pressing process, which means um, you can sometimes extract more oil, or sometimes solvents are used to get the oils out, in which case it needs further processing afterwards. So it's always worth knowing if you're buying these oils what process has been made to actually extract the oil. Um, and so what goodness am I really getting out of it? And the cold press tend to keep most of the goodness of the oil in with them. Um, so I said now, we have so many oils to choose from because you think of the, the plethora of different plants that are out there and the seeds. All of those seeds can be pressed um, to create their own individual oils. And just as, as plants will have their own individual characteristics, so that's true of the oils that they produce. So all these different plant seed oils all have their own nature and their own character. And it's by understanding though, that character um, that we can know which oils are good to use for which applications. Um, and often if you're making skincare products, it might be three or four oils that you combine together um, for the different properties that they each bring to create your product. Um, and so um, the important thing is to know what are the different characteristics of the oils. And so that's what I'd like to focus on today. Um, and there's a couple of different ways of learning, of course, about things. You can either study them, or you can actually experience them and try them. And so we'll do both of those today, so you get a bit of an understanding, and then a bit of a test and try and see what it feels like. Um, so, the understanding first, the science bit, as it were. Um, and I'll put my hands up straight away and say I'm, I'm not a scientist at all. Um, my background is archaeology and anthropology, and I'm sort of people in the past and, and that kind of thing. <coughs> um, but through developing skincare products, I've come to a new love of chemistry <coughs> um, through playing with all these different ingredients and learning about them. Um, so I'm going to give you a complete layperson's description of the chemistry in these. So if the chemists here, I do, do apologise, um, but hopefully it means you'll be able to understand it. Um, because the plant seed oils are basically made up primarily of fatty acids, um, chains of fatty acids, and they look a bit like this. So, uh, like visual aids, um, carbon atom, uh, carbon molecules rather, um, with hydrogen molecules attached to them. So, uh, another name for these oils is um, triglycerides because of this sort of three-part format that they have. And each oil will have 4 to 50 different fatty acids. Don't need to worry about that, but they're, all the fatty acids are made up of chains like this of carbon molecules all stitched together. Might be um, 16, 18 is quite common, up into the 20s in terms of these chains of carbon molecules. Um, and if you can imagine that, that's just one chain, but a natural oil or fatty acid is, is lots of these stacked together. Um, and when you look at a, a, a chain like that, that's um, quite a sort of structured arrangement, quite solid, so you can imagine you have lots of those together, um, you've got quite a solid, stable structure there, um, and you will end up with quite a solid, stable kind of product. So when you see um, all of these strung together like that, 
Uh, you can see that the carbons all have a nice hydrogen lined up with them. They're also completely saturated with hydrogen. Um, so this is a saturated fat, um, and it's a nice solid structure, so it's probably a butter or a very, very dense, thick oil that you get that's saturated like that. Um, that's a standard layout. But what also happens is that you get um, the chains changing a little bit sometimes like this where your carbon atoms um, and like as well, instead of having um, the hydrogens attached all the time, they're missing a couple of hydrogens and you get gaps in the chain. Um, and those gaps um, are what create um, um, uh, unsaturated fats. So you have monounsaturated, if it's one gap, or sometimes you've got more than one gap in your chain um, and you end up with your duo or polyunsaturated fats. And Imagine the impact of having a little break in the chain like that, that's a missing gap there. It means it's not such a solid structure. So when you put these strings of carbons together, you're actually going to get a little bit of give and a little bit of bend. So your monounsaturated ones with a little gap like that are going to have a, a sort of, um, there's your slightly viscous, thicker oils. Your ones where there's more gaps, you're going to have um, a much runnier oil there because there's much more flow in that structure, a lot more space. So there, the um, saturated and the unsaturated um, fats that we have, um, and these make the majority of our oils here. Typically we've got the omega-3 oils here and the omega-6 oils there. So they're the really great essential fatty acids. The gaps in the chain are important there um, because they change the nature of the oil in terms of how fluid and flexible it is. Um, but the other really important thing about those gaps is that whenever you've got a space it has the potential for something to fill it. Um, and what can come into those gaps is oxygen. Um, and when you've got oxygen coming into your chain, that's oxidisation, which in terms of oils is rancidity. So that means your oil is going off as soon as you, you, you're getting it um, oxidising. So it means that these um, oils, which are a lovely ones to use, because they're nice and fluid and they've got all different benefits, they have a greater potential going off quicker, um, a shorter shelf life therefore, because they've got the place potential for oxygen to come in and go around it. Now, there is a bit of a saving grace in this, in that um, I said the, the oils are mostly made of essential fatty acids, but in fact, that's 85 to 95 percent. There's a little bit at the end of the chain, which is called the healing fraction, which is completely different in composition, but really important to know about, because um, the healing fraction contains the kind of things which will give the oil its colour or maybe its scent and also other trace minerals and things are in there so the, the kind of goodies that come along with these oils when we're using them are contained within that healing fraction and some of the goodies that are in there are antioxidants which is lovely for our skin and also lovely for the oil as well so it means that you can't just take as a rule uh, you take things a rule of thumb that the, the gaps um, in, in terms of the, um, how, how um, stable an oil is. Um, but actually, the healing fraction can sometimes help that oil and mean that it doesn't go off quite as quickly as you might have expected it to. And the double bonus is that when you're putting a blend together, I said you might combine several oils, and sometimes um, the healing fraction of one oil can also help some of the other oils that are in the blend, which is where you know, sort of tend to combine what you've got going on there. Um, now, you might be thinking, how do these different changes in the world come about? Um, and of course, a lot of it is to do with the plants and the actual seeds they come from, but also it's to do with the climate that they're growing in. In that, um, to get a lovely stable structure like this, you need really stable growing conditions. So take yourself to the tropics. Think about um, an equator, the even amounts of sun and warmth and, and daylight um, through the year. Very stable growing conditions will get you a lovely stable oil or butter like this. But take yourself to where we are now and our temperate conditions and we know it's changeable from day to day. Um, and certainly through the seasons you're getting variable amounts of sunlight and warmth and rainfall. So you're getting much more unstable growing conditions, so you're likely to get a more unstable oil like this with much more variety and change within it. So as a rule of thumb again, 
And these are all very general things, but typically you'll get your stable oils grown in tropical regions, and the oils that you can get from plants that are grown close to home here will likely to be less stable oils. Um, which is a bit of a problem uh, when you're formulating skincare. Because if you're a professional skincare formulator, um, you know that one of the crucial tests that your product's going to go through uh, before they can hit anyone in, in public is a stability test. Because you've got to be able to prove that once you've made your lovely, lovely sort of blend, um, that it's going to stay like it is all the time that it's going through manufacturing, coming out through the transport, and again sitting on the shelves, and then coming and sitting in the customer's home. They've got to have the same experience. It's got to be consistent and stable all the way through. And so the um, temptation, therefore, is always to use the most stable oils to be able to create those products because that's going to give your formula a better chance of being stable. Um, so what you'll find is that when you go to shops and you're buying lovely natural products off the shelves, um, and as you always do, you turn to the back and look at the label and read the ingredients on it, um, check what it is that you're going to be putting onto your skin. When you're reading those ingredients, you will pretty much always find that you're seeing um, things that have grown, the plants have grown in tropical regions because they're the stable plants that people have chosen to use in those products. Um, so I, I haven't yet found a product on the shelf which have not got something tropical in it. Um, so if you do find anything, let me know because I'd be fascinated to know. Um, but I, I find that by actually to going to the blend yourself route, um, it means that I haven't got to worry about um, that stability for the long, long term in terms of shelf life and things. I can make a product, I'll be using it within the next few days, weeks, months, depending on what the product is, um, and so I can have my full choice of oils and I can be using the oils specifically for the benefits they bring to my skin instead of the benefits that they're going to bring to the product. Um, and so I'm always looking and seeking to use local oils and I think it's a trend that's starting to get more coverage. So in a lot of areas we're concerned to, to buy local and use local, um, but the, the beauty miles kind of conversation is only just starting with skincare. And people are thinking about it in terms of um, the packaging, in terms of the ingredients, in terms of where things have been sourced, how they've been sourced, who's been involved in the sourcing, um, and thinking about all those kind of credentials that come into your beauty product. And when you look at the ingredients, it's an awful lot to have to think about. And they're all great things to consider. Um, but for me, the, the benefits of using local are kind of, so it's a, a different kind of thing that I'm considering. Um, because for me, the using local means I'm gathering plants that are growing around me. I'm looking at things that grow, particularly what we might call weeds. I'm looking at them through different eyes because I'm seeing the benefits they can actually bring into the skincare and daily life. I'm connecting with my local environment in a completely different way. And I'm having that nature coming into my skincare on a daily basis. <coughs> so that's for me where the local benefit is there. I like the fact that it's saving the beauty miles and things as well, but for me there's, there's a whole lot more that your skincare can bring to you each day when you're using the local ingredients that are in it. Um, so let's start with um, lots of different characteristics you can put on them, but um, one is how quickly they absorb into your skin. So this is quite an important one when you're making a product because um, for instance, if you're making um, a hand cream, say, if you want it to be one that you're just going to use on a sort of day to day basis, day after you've done washing or something, then ideally it's something that soaks in pretty quickly so you can pop it on and then get on with your, your jobs or whatever without worrying about having greasy hands. Um, but then there are other occasions when maybe you're making a cream and you, you actually want it to have a sort of more of a barrier protection. So you, you, it's a good thing if it, if it lingers a little bit longer on your skin. So it's good to know the absorption rates of your oils. How quickly is your skin going to absorb them? And when we think about this, um, we can think about, um, do, do you know with, with perfumes, they have the, the top, middle and base notes. So your, your smell of perfumes will hit you the top note and it, you get that zing of it first of all, but then it'll dissipate quite quickly. Um, and then there's a, a middle note that sort of holds the whole thing together. And, and a base note, which maybe you don't catch first of all, but gradually it's coming through, and then that's the, the, the note that will linger with you. That's what your oils are a bit like that as well, so you have top, middle, and base oils. 
So as you might the top oil, when you put it on your skin, you're expecting it to sort of sink pretty quickly and disappear quite quickly. So let's give it a try and see if it works for you. And the sample I'm going to try with this is jojoba oil, which you've maybe heard of. It's been quite popular um, in recent years. So lots of different oils seem to come through in different fads that people get excited about. But jojoba, the reason people get excited about it is because um, it's the one that's considered to be closest in, in structure to our own natural skin oils. So therefore works really, really well with our skin. So when these come around, be careful, I've got to take the top off. Um, just pop the finger over the top, tip it over like that. So you get a little bit of oil on your finger, then you can pass it on to the next person and pop it on. So there's the hope. So you should be getting, uh, I'll, I'll warn you, there's a few coming around, so you'll want a bit of skin space to try different things. <laughs> um, so I hope it, um, a lovely light oil top, well, you should um, disappear quite quickly. So let's have a complete contrast comparison, which is at the other end of the scale, the base oil, so the one that's going to linger around on your skin for a little while. And another oil which you've probably heard of, um, castor oil, I'm going to send around. So again, just finger over, give it a tip, take a little bit of oil and um, see how you get on with the castor oil. Does it feel different to you? Mm. <laughs> get the difference? Thicky. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, it's one of the thickest oils. This, um, it's really difficult to get a base oil that hasn't grown in tropical kind of conditions because um, it's the thicker oil, it's got that more kind of so, thank you. Um, more stable kind of structure like this, um, and yes, much smoothier on your skin. Um, I'm going to send you around a product to try now as a variation. So, what I'll send you around is this is marshmallow dream cream, which is one of my blends, and um, it's an example of where. So, do you want to always blend that top, middle, and base together if you can? And this one has got those top, middle, and bases. So, see them all in combination there in a, in a product. <laughs> yes, just. So marshmallow dream cream, the lovely base oil in there is avocado, and I don't always put base oils into a face cream, but with this one it's a night cream, so I want that base oil to be sinking in over a few hours overnight and taking in, it's got hyaluronic acid in there, and you can see that take plate that in into your skin overnight. Um, so so that, that one won the Best Special Moisturiser Award, so it's a gorgeous combination of that. Yes. So that's um, the difference between a top and a base oil. Let's see, um, that's one of the easier ones to detect. Let's see if you can try the, the next one, which is the difference between um, a rough oil and a smooth oil, which I think is a, a curious characteristic because typically you just think oil's been oily, um, you know, and they're just kind of smoothy type things. Um, but actually, there's quite a sort of spectrum of the very, very smoothest oils, which are. Um, I sort of have a silk onto your skin, gorgeous. Um, through to rougher oils, and you might be well, if you, if you have that gorgeous end, why, why would you have the rougher ones? Um, and the reason for that is because I, I call my hard working oils. So um, if you've got um, dry skin, rough skin, like that, that's when those rough oils come into their own, and they're great for just getting in there and working with your skin. So let's see if you can tell the difference between a smooth and a rough oil. So um, have a little treat first of all of the smooth oil. Wonderful, thank you. Um, now, this is just smooth one. So, um, do you want to try this one first, and then pass it on? So, this is hazelnut oil. So, nut oil alert. Um, but this is lovely smooth one. If you, if, if you don't want to try the nut oil, I can give you an alternative smooth one if you prefer, which I'll come on later. Um, so, so um, smooth oils. I, I, make, I was making up the cleansing oils, and um, I put sort of quite a bit of, the, of this hazelnut in and I, I had to change the blend because I thought no it, it's almost it, it too too smooth I need something with a little bit more grit in it for cleansing oil to feel like it's actually doing some work. <laughs> are they, how refined are they? Um, I try and get oils which aren't refined but occasionally in skincare it's good to use a refined one so for instance um, avocado oil if you don't refine that pretty smelly um, and so it works in some contexts um, but in other contexts where you, you know, like in, in this um, marshmallow dream cream it would be overpowering yeah. if I had the unrefined version so I use the refined there. And that hazelnut oil? Hazelnut oil is, that's just, that's it is, yes. Yeah. 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 
Um, now, the, your example of a rough oil I'm going to give you is a lovely local oil, which is borage. Um, and um, do you know the borage plant? I just want to look over there. If you haven't got borage in the garden, you've got no courage or no hope or whatever it is. Um, and I, I love borage. Um, beautiful blue starry flowers. Fantastic oil, one of our best sources of GLA, so it's really prized in skincare for borage oil. Um, so the borage plant has got all those like bristly hairs on it, um, so it's quite kind of um, quite awkward to touch actually. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me that if that's what the plant's like, if the oil it produces is a rough oil. So sometimes you get these little clues as you go along. So are you, are you feeling the difference? It's much more difficult to detect than uh, difference. So we're not talking sandpaper right here. Um, so I said I'd send around the orange smoothing balm. So this is um, one of my hard working products, I say. Um, when it's things like the things for dry skin, the foot balm, things like that, I use these rough oils in there um, because uh, I think they work really well. It's good. It's good but there's orange smoothing balm if you want to give a little try. Um, and uh, designed for, as it says, all the rough and knobbly bits. <laughs> So, if we're keeping up, we'll move on to this third property that can keep swinging around whilst I describe to you um, the third one. Um, yeah, I referred to um, the mass massage oil. Oh, did, I didn't refer to massage oil. I think um, in terms of the, the um, aromatherapy, the base oils, and all that, and and we're using them in, in massage. Um, well, some oils are good for massage and others aren't so good. And the difference is um, their characteristics as to whether they're short or long oils. So um, uh, a long oil, you'll be able to put it on your skin and draw it out at quite a distance. You get that lovely long stroke, which obviously beautiful for massage, great for things like body oils and just being able to have a lovely long stretch of oil. Absolute disaster for face oil because do that and you're slipping all over the place with your oils. Um, so where you want a contained kind of um, uh, sort of application, that's where you need to use your short oils. So um, if I'm developing a face product, I'll probably use about 70% short oils in it, and then just a little bit of long oil. There's particular qualities from those oils I want to bring in. Um, so let's try um, a long and a short oil to see if you can get that difference between long and short. Um, and the long oil I will share with you is um, the absolute queen of plant seed oils. Um, it's rose hip seed. So, um, so we've had a little try with the long one and a nice long stretch with that. Um, here's a comparator one, just so you get to my um, which is a short oil. So this, when you try it, probably won't stretch um, quite as far. And the oil I'm talking about here is one of my, my favourites. It's camelina oil, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, it's camelina for wild flax. Um, and it, I love it because it's um, a local, you're getting the difference in the <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's a lovely one that grows in the UK, so you can get UK sources of camelina oil. And um, it's, it's a, a real gentle all rounder. It's quite a light oil, you can bring it into different blends. So I quite often use the camelina in, in a face cream for making that. Um, it's a nice, nice friendly oil. So we have a question about how do you actually turn from the oils into the products? Um, what else goes in there as well? Um, and that's the, ne the next bit I was going to talk to you about because it's lovely to know about all these oils, but actually you want to get a new some. And as we said, we can use them. So you can use them on their own if you want to just lovely body oil to put on. Um, they're great to say in combination if you bring a few different ones together and bring their qualities together as, as your body oils or serums or face oils. Um, but it gets really exciting when you start then making different looks with them. And pretty much all the products that are out there um, will have a combination of four basic ingredients, which are um, the oils, and things that we've just been trying, and um, the butters, which as we know now are sort of a more solid version of the oils. So oils, butters, um, some kind of wax, and personally I use these wax in most of my products um, because it's the wax which I can locally source and um, it's a brilliant um, wax in terms of affinity with skin. But there are lots of other options in terms of waxes, but pretty much all of them come from tropical sources. And just personally, I like to bring things as close to home as possible. Um, and the fourth ingredient is water. So if you've got 
those four ingredients, you'll be able to make pretty much any of the products in some combination. Um, now, your oils, using your own, you make lovely butters, combine your oils and butters, and if you put in a, a whipped body butter, they're fantastic to do. Um, really simple and easy. Um, when you're bringing in the, the waxes as well, you're making things like balms, like that orange smoothing balm, or lip balms and things like that. Um, all those are really simple to make. So where you've got a slightly more solid ingredient going in, that just needs some, some gentle heat basically to melt it so you can add it and combine with the oils. And this sort of thing is fantastic, it's my, my melting pan. And I sit that over a pan of boiling water, so it just means I can have my ingredients in there and they're just going to very gentle heat. Because one of the, the golden rules for working with these oils is yes. give them as little heat as is necessary to be able to combine them. So some oils don't really like to be heated very much at all. Um, but anyway, um, the, the beeswax is going to be the most solid thing in, in my thing I make. Um, and that melts at 70 degrees, so I can keep that heat gentle there. Once the beeswax melted, I know that's as hot as it will get, and then I can take it off the heat and then start introducing other things. Um, and essential oils in particular, I only want to go in in a cooling stage, about 40 degrees or less. Um, and plenty of products you can make actually cold, and, and obviously the, the, the cooler you can, you can make things, the less energy you're using in making too. So, um, balms, um, really simple, by buying those just with gentle heat. If you want to make a cream, or a lotion, um, or any of the more kind of spritz or end of things, it gets a bit more complicated, because that's when you start bringing water. And the complication there is that, of course, oil and water don't mix. So, in order to get that to work right, um, you need to create an emulsion. And there are particular um, emulsifying waxes and things like that that you can bring into the blend to help that emulsion. And a lot of techniques as well to be able to get that emulsion right in terms of managing the temperatures, keeping the, the stirring combinations right. It's all written in the book actually, all the different tips of how to get a good emulsion. Um, so, um, it's perfectly possible, but you've got to be careful um, in getting the emulsion right when you bring the water in. And the, other tricky bit when you've got water in a blend is that um, you can pretty much guarantee that your product is going to go off quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking a matter of days before we start to see more than things on the product. Mm -hmm. So um, your options there are make a very small amount of product if you're just making it for yourself that you're going to use straight away, not a problem. Um, treat it like your food. Um, get to the fridge, you can probably be using it for a couple of days or so. Some products you can split the batches and then freeze some of it, and then that's okay. But typically, you're going to find yourself needing to use some kind of preservative into your blend in order to be able to create a cream like that, or something that you can keep for a while on the shelf. So, um, all perfectly possible to do with those containers. And I wish I could go into more detail and show you all done, but in the four minutes we've got, I don't think I've <laughs> got to give you anyone that. But um, I, I do run courses and things as well, so. Um, the, where are you based? I'm um, based in, in Cam, just on the road. Yeah, you know, you know, yeah, I'm just very, very local, so yes, often in the headquarters around here. I <laughs> just want to make a quick question about what, what is a healthy preservative, an example for a healthy preservative? The preservative I always use is Preservative Eco. It's just, I use that because it's the one I'm used to and it's the most simple one. Quite often you get preservatives that work at different pHs and things like that and get to quite complicated. Um, but Preservative Eco is a relatively easy one to use. Um, preservative Eco is its brand name. Um, it's a combination of different ingredients within it. But um, you do need to buy a proprietary preservative like that. Um, and the job of a preservative is to kill off the bacteria and the mould and everything that are in the product. So inevitably that would mean it's a, a bit of a nasty. But you keep it at the absolute minimum level that you need for however long you want the product with. Um, so that's another benefit of things like blend it yourself. Because yeah. why would you use a moisturizer at all? Why not just stick with um, <laughs> That's a whole other chapter of the book. Um, <laughs> um, the moisturizer, it's because your skin is a combination of oil and water. So you want to be using both together, basically, and getting the, the water into your skin. So sometimes if you've got dry skin, it might not be because it needs the oils and the it's because it needs the water in it as well. So It'd be nice to think you could, but um, your skin, although it's your largest organ, it's the one that's the bottom of the pecking list in terms of being allocated water. So anywhere else in your body will get given the water it needs before your skin does. So yes, you can keep hydrated through drinking water, and obviously you should, but if you've got a problem with dry skin, much quicker to put something on top of, it, on top of the skin to treat it. Yeah.